Welcome to Fahrenheit 451 Lesson 11, Comparing Settings, Analyzing Tension, and Determining How the Interactions Between Characters Develop a Theme. We've been reading Fahrenheit 451 by Ray Bradbury and analyzing the author's word choice and use of irony. Today we will continue to read The Hearth and the Salamander from Fahrenheit 451 by Ray Bradbury. We will analyze how Clarice and Millie affect Montag and analyze how the setting and tension develop the theme. You will need Fahrenheit 451 by Ray Bradbury. Your reading protocol, conversation stems, and discussion tracker handout from Lesson 1. Your reading log, also from Lesson 1. The Evolution of Montag handout from Lesson 10. And the Anchor Text Theme Tracker handout from Lesson 10. Now you are going to read pages 8 and 9 silently. As you read, be sure to update the evolution of Montag handout to include the impact that Clarice has on Montag. Also be sure to think about this question. What does Montag think about after leaving Clarice? And what is the effect of this on Montag? Now read along as we read aloud pages 10 through 15. Note references to technology found in your reading log, which was found on the Fahrenheit 451 Lesson 1 post, and it's listed as Lesson 11 References to Technology. So you're going to want to go ahead and open that and then turn in your Fahrenheit book to page 10 and follow along. Without turning on the light, he imagined how this room would look. His wife stretched on the bed, uncovered and cold, like a body displayed on the lid of a tomb, her eyes fixed to the ceiling by invisible threads of steel, immovable and in her ears the tiny little seashells, the thimble radios tamped tight, and an electric ocean of sound, of music and talk and music and talk coming in, coming in on the shore of her unsleeping mind. The room was indeed empty. Every night the waves came in and bore her off to on their great tides of sound, floating her wide-eyed toward morning. There had been no night in the last two years that Mildred had not swum that sea, had not gladly gone down in it for the third time. The room was cold, but nonetheless he felt he could not breathe. He did not wish to open the drapes and open the French windows, for he did not want the moon to come into the room. So with the feeling of a man who will die in the next hour for lack of air, he felt his way toward his open, separate, and therefore cold bed. An instant before his foot hit the object on the floor, he knew he would hit such an object. It was not unlike the feeling he had experienced before turning the corner and almost knocking the girl down. His foot, sending vibrations ahead, received back echoes of the small barrier across its path, even as the foot swung. His foot kick, kicked. The object gave a dull clink and slid off in the darkness. He stood very straight and listened to the person on the dark bed in co the completely featureless night. The breath coming out the nostrils was so faint, it stirred only the fr furthest fringes of life, a small leaf, a black feather, a single fiber of hair. He still did not want outside light. He pulled out his igniter, felt the salamander etched on its silver disc, gave it a flick, Two moonstones looked up at him in the light of his small handheld fire. Two pale moonstones buried in a creek of clear water over which the life of the world ran, not touching him, not touching them. Mildred! 
Her face was like a snow-covered island, upon which rain might fall, but it felt no rain, over which clouds might pass their morning shadows, but she felt no shadow. There was only the singing of the thimble wasp in her tamped shut ears, and her eyes all glass, and breath going in and out, softly, faintly, in and out her nostrils, and her not caring whether it came or went, went or came. The object he had sent tumbling with his foot now glinted under the edge of his own bed. The small crystal bottle of sleeping tablets, which earlier today had been filled with thirty capsules, and which now lay uncapped and empty in the light of the tiny flare. He stood there with the, where the sky over the house screamed. There was a tremendous ripping sound, as if two giant hands had torn ten thousand miles of black linen down the seam. Montag was cut in half. He felt his chest chopped down and split apart. The jet bombers going over, going over, going over. One, two, one, two, one, two. Six of them, nine of them, twelve of them. One and one and one and another and another and another. Did all the screaming for him. He opened his own mouth and let their shriek come down and out between his bared teeth. The house shook. The flare went out in his hand. The moonstones vanished. He felt his hand plunge toward the telephone. The jets were gone. He felt his lips move, brushing the mouthpiece of the phone. Emergency hospital. A terrible whisper. He felt that the stars had been pulverized by the sound of the black jets, and that in the morning the earth would be covered with their dust like a strange snow. This was his idiot thought as he stood shivering in the dark and let his lips go on, moving and moving. They had this machine. They had two machines, really. One of them slid down into your stomach like a black cobra going down an echoing well, looking for all the old water and the old time gathered there. It drank up the green matter that floated to the top, that flowed to the top in a slow boil. Did it drink of the darkness? Did it suck out all the poisons accumulated with the years? It fed in silence with an occasional sound of inner suffocation and blind searching. It had an eye. The impersonal operator of the machine could, by wearing a special optical helmet, gaze into the soul of the person whom he was pumping out. What did the eye see? He did not say. He saw, but did not see what the eye saw. The entire operation was not unlike the digging of a trench in one's yard. The woman on the bed was no more than a hard stratum of marble they had reached. Go on, anyway, shove the bore down, slush up the emptiness if such a thing could be brought out in the throb of the suction snake. The operator stood smoking a cigarette. The other machine was working, too. The other machine, operated by an equally impersonal fellow in non-stainable reddish-brown coveralls. This machine pumped all the blood from the body and replaced it with, fle fresh, serum and with fle fresh blood and serum. Got to clean him out both ways, said the operator, standing over the silent woman. No use getting the stomach if you don't clean the blood. Leave that stuff in the blood and the blood hits the brain like a mallet. Bang! A couple of thousand times and the brain just gives up. Just quits. Stop it, said Montag. I was just saying, said the operator. Are you done? said Montag. They shut the machines up tight. We're done. His anger did not even touch them. They stood with the cigarette smoke curling around their noses and into their eyes without making them blink or squint. That's fifty bucks. First, why don't you tell me if she'll be all right? Sure, she'll be okay. We got all the mean stuff right in our suitcase here. It can't get at her now. As I said, you take out the old and put in the new and you're okay. Neither of you is an MD. Why didn't they send an MD from emergency? Hell, the operator's cigarette moved on his lip. We get these cases nine or ten a night. Got so many starting a few years ago, we had the special machines built. With the optical lens, of course. That was new. The rest is ancient. You don't need an MD case like this. All you need is two handymen. Clean up the problem in half an hour. Look, he started for the door. We gotta go. Just had another call on the old ear thimble, ten blocks from here. Someone else just jumped off the cap of a pillbox. Call if you need us again. 
keep her quiet. We got a contraceptive in her. She'll wake up hungry. So long. And the men with the cigarettes in their straight-lined mouths, the men with the eyes of puff adders, took up their load of machine and tube, their case of liquid melancholy, and the slow, dark sludge of nameless stuff, and strolled out the door. Montag sank down into a chair and looked at this woman. Her eyes were closed now, gently, and he put out his hand to feel the warmness of breath on his palm. Mildred, he said at last. There are too many of us, he thought. There are billions of us, and that's too many. Nobody knows anyone. Strangers come and violate you. Strangers come and cut your heart out. Strangers come and take your blood. Good God, who were those men? I never saw them before in my life. Half an hour passed. The bloodstream in this woman was new, and it seemed to have done a new thing to her. Her cheeks were very pink, and her lips were very fresh and full of color, and they looked soft and relaxed. Someone else's blood there. If only someone else's flesh and brain and memory. If only they could have taken her mind along to the dry cleaners, and emptied the pockets, and steamed and cleansed it, and reblocked it, and brought it back in the morning. If only... He got up and put the drapes, put back the drapes, and opened the windows wide to let the night air in. It was two o'clock in the morning. Was it only an hour ago, Clarice McClellan in the street, and him coming in, and the dark room, and his foot kicking the little crystal bottle? Only an hour, but the world had melted down and sprung up in a new and colorless form. Laughter blew across the moon-colored lawn from the house of Clarice and her father and mother and the uncle who smiled so quietly and so earnestly. Above all, their laughter was relaxed and hearty and not forced in any way, coming from the house that was so brightly lit this late at night, while all the other houses were kept to themselves in the darkness. Montag heard the voices talking, 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 giving, talking, weaving, reweaving their hypnotic web. Montag moved out through the French windows and crossed the lawn without even thinking of it. He stood outside the talking house in the shadows, thinking he might even tap on their door and whisper, Let me come in. I won't say anything. I just want to listen. What is it you're saying? But instead he stood there, very cold, his face a mask of ice, listening to a man's voice, the uncle, moving along at an easy pace. Well, after all, this is the age of the disposable tissue. Blow your nose on a person, wad them, flush them away, reach for another, blow, wad, flush. Everyone using everyone else's coattails. How are you supposed to root for the home team when you don't even have a program or know the names? For that matter, what color jerseys are they wearing as they trot out on the field? Montag moved back to his own house, left the window wide, checked Mildred, tucked the covers about her carefully, and then lay down with the moonlight on his cheekbones and on the frowning ridges of his brow, with the moonlight distilled in each eye to form a single cat silver cataract there. One drop of rain, Clarice. Another drop, Mildred. A third, the uncle. A fourth, the fire tonight. One, Clarice, two, Mildred, three, uncle, four, fire, one, Mildred, two, Clarice, one, two, three, four, five, Clarice, Mildred, uncle, fire, sleeping tablets, men, disposable tissue, coattails, wad, blow, wad, flush, Clarice, Mildred, uncle, fire, tablets, tissues, blow, wad, flush, one, two, three, one, two, three, rain, the storm. The uncle laughing, thunder falling downstairs, the whole world pouring down, the fire gushing up in a volcano, all rushing on down around in a spouting roar and rivering stream toward morning. I don't know anything anymore, he said, and let a sleep lozenge dissolve on his tongue. We're going to discuss the questions on the slide, but before we do, I want you to reread the paragraph that begins with an instant before, found on page 10, and the paragraph that begins with the object he on page 11, to understand that Montag finds the bottle of pills. Also, I want you to reread the first full paragraph on page 12 to understand the procedure the emergency workers perform on Millie. So what happened to Millie? Well, 
What did Montag find? What did the emergency workers do? And what did they say? Now let's think about the technology that you saw in this passage. What technology did you notice? And it is okay to use your reading log notes to answer these. How would you describe this technology? And how does it relate to the technology that we use? Let's discuss. Reread the excerpt from the passage that we read silently for, to yourselves. As you're reading, I want you to think about what noise is being covered up by the seashells and what does this noise represent? Now let's discuss those two questions. The excerpt on this slide is from earlier in the text when Clarice and Montag are walking. I want you to read this excerpt silently as well. Now let's discuss the two questions on the slide. How does this setting in the section we read aloud compare to the setting of Clarice and Montag's walk from earlier in the text? How does this setting develop a theme? Now we're going to read aloud pages 15 through 18. Each of you may or may not have an opportunity to read aloud, but follow along silently while others are reading. Also, as we're reading this section, note references to technology in your reading log found in the Fahrenheit 451 Lesson 1 post, Lesson 12, References to Technology. We're going to start at the beginning of page 15 and end on page 18 with the words, into the rain. Do I have any volunteers to read? So now we're gonna look at the technology that was covered in this lesson, in this section as well. But we have an extra question that we're going to discuss. We're still going to discuss the following. What technology did you notice? How would you describe this technology? How does it relate to the technology we use? And now a more insidious question, what is this technology covering up? So let's discuss. Now we're going to discuss a couple more questions that relate to setting. How does this setting compare to the setting of Clarice and Montag's walk? And how does this contrast in settings develop a theme? Let's discuss.
Now I want you to open up your Anchor Text Theme Tracker and add a row to the Theme Tracker called Setting and complete the row. Again, you're going to be adding Setting to the, another row. Now let's look at the, at the prompt on the screen. We're going to discuss this prompt in just a second. I want you to compare and contrast the impact that Millie and Clarice have on Montag. Let's discuss. Now taking the information we just discussed, I want you to add to your evolution of Montag handout, if you haven't already done so, with this information. We're going to be talking about another literary element that I want you to focus in on and that literary element is tension. Tension is an element in a novel that evokes emotions such as worry, anxiety, fear, and stress on both the part of the reader and the characters. I would like a volunteer to read this passage aloud. What do you notice about the author's craft, literary devices, and literary elements in this excerpt? How do the author's craft, literary devices, and literary elements contribute to the meaning of the excerpt? How does the language of the text reveal the author's point of view? How does the language of the text reveal a theme or central idea? What do all of the things that Montag lists have in common? What do you notice about the structure of the main paragraph in this excerpt? What impact does this structure have on the reader? What other passage in the text is this similar to? And now I want you to add tension to the anchor text theme tracker. So you're going to put it in a row beneath setting. And now for homework, you're going to read pages 19 through 25 of Fahrenheit 451 by Ray Bradbury. You're going to need the novel to do so, so make sure you take it home. After reading, you're going to update the evolution of Montag handout to include the impact of Montag's walk with Clarice. You're going to need to access your evolution of Montag handout to do so. Your homework is posted in the assignment uh, for lesson 11 that you access today it is going to be listed there so there is no excuse not to find it and finish it congratulations you have finished lesson 11 of Fahrenheit 451 unit in this lesson 
you learned that Montag lives in a society that relies heavily on technology to distract people from what is really going on. You also analyzed how complex characters interact with each other and how setting develops a theme.